and Belt Baseball Podcast with Matt and Ty, joined by legendary Texas State baseball coach Ty Harrington. Ty, it's great to see you. Ready to talk some baseball in the Sun Belt Conference. I'm always ready, as you know that. When it comes to baseball and certainly the Sun Belt, I'm more than ready. Well, coming up in our first podcast, we're going to talk to Louisiana head coach Mag Deggs. His raging Cajuns are off to a tremendous start. Georgia State is also hanging around near the top of the Sun Belt. We'll talk about them and Coastal and Southern Miss as well. We'll take a look at the latest RPI. There are seven teams in the top 55. We'll get into that. And we'll also name our Sun Belt starting nine and look ahead to this coming week tie in the big game. So let's go ahead and get started with our number one story, and that the Cajuns are rolling. Louisiana, first ever three-game sweep of Texas State and San Marcos. You were there. You called all three games. Bobcats uh, were a team 17-6 and six in their last 23 Sun Belt series. So it's hard to win a series in San Marcos, much less get a sweep. But that tells you how good the Cajuns are going right now. They have the longest winning streak in the nation, Coach. 11 games. They're 20-8 and eight, 20 and eight overall. And they're eight and one in the Sun Belt. What'd you see out of this Louisiana team? What's interesting is when you you visit with Coach Deggs, and I've known Matt forever. It seems like probably too long for his sake. And so, but he and I have, have competed against each other for so so long. But historically, with one of Matt's teams, it's always been a tough-minded, really creative offense. Still is incredibly creative. If you go back to even. I think it was 2016 or 15 where, um, when Louisiana was number two in the country. The Cajuns were number two in the country with that offense. It was so crazy. They stole 160-something bags that year, right? Well, this team's a little bit different, and it's shaped a little bit different. But he, he, he kept going, well, we're really gritty. I was like, Matt, you're gritty, and you're good. And he's like, well, okay, yeah, we, we, we are playing better than they are, and they've got some key pieces that are really good to this team. I think if you do anything, Matt, you start out on the mound for these guys. I mean, they were so impressive. And, you know, if you go in there and you look at um, the, the ERAs even coming into the weekend, you know, two-something ERAs, team batting average, opponent of batting average coming into the weekend, 211 in college baseball. And so all those things were, were came into play this weekend against Texas State. They pitched great. I'll tell you what else I saw. I saw two of the best infields play this weekend. Both teams defensively, I think there was a total, I think, of something like eight double plays turned. And so it was tremendous defense being played out there. But truly, the pitching led it for the Cajuns. And then their ability to hit and still have Matt Deggs type creative offenses was fun to watch. They're a good team. They're back-to-back now in NCAA, and they're tracking towards a third consecutive NCAA regional appearance. And, uh, you know, is this team got a shot at a Super in Omaha, perhaps? Um, I think, if, you know, I'm going to answer that question with almost any team at this point, and that is you have got to be healthy the rest of the year. People sometimes always use the mentality, and you're supposed to as a coach, the next man up, right? Well, the next man up may not be as good. And it's probably the next man normally, up it, right, normally is not. So health is always a huge part of that. I think if they stay healthy, and I think, you know, they they were playing a, a freshman in center field, some two, and uh, that, that's going to be a really good player. And he, you know, and he'll get even better as the year goes on. I think LaFleur gets he- healthy. He was not healthy. They played him on Friday night and then pinched hit him twice at first base. So I, I think if he gets healthy and then they stay healthy, I mean, they're a regional team, you know, a super regional team. Do they have that front line, guys? It's very possible. All right. Uh, story number two, Georgia State still hanging near the top. They're 7-2 and two through the first three weekends. The schedule has been favorable for them in that they've beaten James Madison. They have ULM. They've had South Alabama not taking anything away from those teams. I'm just looking at their conference records, so it's a little bit right. a little bit. A little bit easier for him in the first three weeks just based on where those three teams are in the conference right now. But uh, they got a tough week ahead of them. They got you know, the home run leaders in the country, Georgia, in their non-conference on Tuesday. And then they got a big series in Statesboro against their rivals on uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So your thoughts on Georgia State and where they stand 7-2 and two through the first three weekends? Oh, I think it's, I think it's uh, fair 
if that's the right word to say that, that you know, maybe the schedule has been in their favor a little bit um, in a sense that I know South Alabama has been injured. And, uh, and the timing of that might have been good for them. I, you know, who knows? But it's so hard to, to sweep on the road, just like the Cajuns did this past weekend in San Marcos. So many things have to go your way. So many things have to be right. Well, Georgia State was able to do that at South Alabama. That is really hard to do. I mean, that's a tough place to play. And so, I, I mean, yeah, maybe so. It, it's gone their way. but Or I'm sorry, the, the schedule has. But, again, I mean, I, I, I think it was – and you may have to remind me, a, a, maybe a week or two ago, they they were down to the last, they had three outs to go get against Clemson, or was it Clemson? Or South Carolina. Somebody like that, South Carolina. And, uh, and then you know, South Carolina scored late. Um, so it shows you that, you know, that, you know, even with the strength of schedule of playing a team like that, um, that they're capable of winning. And, uh, and so it'd be interesting to see. I haven't had a chance to see them yet other than picking up a stat sheet and, you know, reading through some of their, you know, players and different things like that. But certainly, uh, you know, anytime you're sitting at the top of this conference for any amount of time, and I'm talking about the first weekend, you're probably doing pretty good. Yeah. And James Madison's a team that coming into the weekend and still right now has the second best RPI in the Sun Belt. Yeah. They're at 33 right now. So uh, Will Mize has been big for them. He leads them uh, in home runs. Dylan Strickland also had a big home run for them in that, in their final game against James Madison as they were able to come from behind and uh, get that series win. Now, story number three, speaking of James Madison, congratulations to Duke's head coach, Marlon Eikenberry. He picks up his 200th career victory with James Madison in that uh, series in Atlanta. It's his ninth season with JMU. He's done a really nice job there. Got a long way to go to catch uh, number ones and number twos. Brad Babcock and Spanky McFarland. Now that's a great name. You know that that's a great head coach with a name like yes, Spanky it is. McFarland. So, Eikenberry's got 491 overall wins going back to when he was the head coach at his alma mater uh, VMI. But congratulations to Coach Eikenberry there. You know what it's like to get 500 wins, so that's a big, a big achievement. He's approaching that in his I'm career. Gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna throw a coach phrase at you. That just about every coach, if they watch this show, we're going to appreciate winning is hard. And anytime you've won that many games, it just shows you how, how long you've been doing it, how hard you've worked at it. And again, winning is hard. It's not as easy as, as fans want to make it, alumni want to make it. And uh, so congratulations to him. That's a tremendous milestone for him and his organization, but for him as a head coach as well. And you start reading through all those victories, going all the way back to VMI, that's a lot of victories. That's a lot of victories, and VMI is not the easiest place to get a win. No, that's right. Winning, that's right. Winning's hard, and in some places it it's is. even harder. So, yeah. That's right. Uh, number four story of the week, Southern Miss keeps pace uh, in the conference with a series win over Troy. Uh, this was a sneaky good matchup. We're talking about two of the four teams that went to NCAA regionals last year, and, of course, Southern Miss uh, double back-to-back -back, uh, super regional host as well. Uh, Southern Miss is uh, tied with Coastal at 6-3 and three in the conference. They got a big start from their senior right-hander, Will Armistead, on Saturday. He went five-plus strong innings, had a career-high 10 strikeouts. Dylan, or make that, Dalton McIntyre had a five-hit game for him as well uh, in the series openers. They run ruled Troy in the series opener of this series. You know, it's interesting that now that you see that they have a run rule uh, on every game, it's not just getaway day now. I think there's going to be times coaches, I know this sounds kind of goofy, but you're going to see some coaches, if it happens with a game where you've got a game following the next day, probably yeah. run some guys out there on the mound that normally wouldn't be out there. Game ends and you just kind of go, hey, that, we had yeah. a bad day. Let's yeah, it's not like you're moment. quitting. Uh, nope. It's not like you're right. quitting, but you're giving guys on the back end an opportunity. Show me what you got. That's right. And if it, it doesn't work out. That's fine. We're not going to burn our front line pitchers here. We got two more that's games right. to go. Absolutely. There's a, there's, there's a thought press behind that. I know sometimes people are like, oh my, what you got to roll so and so out there and all that. And you're like, as a coach, you're like, hey, I got to strategize. If just by losing today, I don't want to create a loss for tomorrow by, you know, compounding what I've already happened today. And you'll see some coaches maybe run some guys, again, guys that maybe don't have as much time or guys that have been rehabbing, guys that have been, a lot of different scenarios 
but you don't want to lose two games in one day. And I think this run rule, you'll start to see some of these coaches, you know, navigate around that and use that as, hey, we got beef, we got to move on. Yeah, that was one of the surprising things I saw. I call a lot of SEC baseball, too. And last year they had the run rule. And there were a lot of run rule games. I was really surprised. And then I kind of figured out exactly what you're talking about right here. Coaches got into those situations where they're down big and it's getting late in the game. We're not going to burn any more starting pitching here. We'll give these guys a chance. And if they can hold them, great. And we can come back and win, great. But we're not going to burn frontline guys trying to do it. So. so that is sometimes when you're chasing 10 runs, it's two more innings. Yeah, like six more outs, possibly. That's a lot more pitches. So, <laughs> it is. It certainly is. And so, anyway, enough on that. But it is part of every game now in, in uh, the Sun Belt as opposed to just get away day. Yeah, it's another level of strategy, no doubt. And we'll be watching yep. that and tracking that as we look at this season. All right. Story number five before we jump into our Matt Deggs interview. Uh, Coastal Carolina remains at the top of the RPI for Sun Belt teams. So, The latest D1 baseball nitty-gritty report RPI. It's not the official NCAA RPI, but it's close. So we'll go with this. There's one top 30 team. There's two in the top 35, seven in the top 55, which tells me, you know, if you're in that top 55 and we get to the end of the season, then you got a shot. I mean, and we've seen that historically here. Uh, So that's a big number. But Coastal right now is 18 in the country. James Madison still tracking there at 33. And then you've got like all these some I've never seen this many teams in one conference bunched up together. You got Southern Miss at 49, Louisiana at 51, Georgia Southern 52, Georgia State at 53, and South Alabama at 54. I would say that, that part of that is if you look at the loss record on some of these um, and who they played. It's going to have something to do with the strength of, of their schedule. So you would think if you look at some of the records, you go, well, that's not a very good record. But yet their RPI is right at that, you know, where do we go from we got to get below 45 to make sure we're going to, you know, below 40-ish somewhere in there or get into the 40s to have a chance for sure. The 30s, give ourselves a chance. You're not that far away. Even if you haven't played great, you're not that far away. But the good news is, is I think the strength of, this, of the conference historically from the years past is we've had two 14 bids you know, over the last two years. But then I think the, the conference itself, if they're playing against each other, which is all you're doing this time of year on the weekend, just playing against each other, your, your strength of schedule and your RPI has got to be good. Otherwise, if you lose one of those conference games, you, you, you take a dip. Or if you win, you don't move the meter as far. So with the historic part of it, it's a, that's great news for the Sun Belt. And with so many teams, in that same space here, those 50, that 54 to 30 ish type number, they can, they've got room to go in the right direction with wins that the teams do. And then most of the teams this time of year still play good Tuesday games. You know, like Texas mm-hmm. State, I know that only because I'm, I'm on it tomorrow night. They play the Aggies, you know, I think they're ranked number three in the country. Uh, so right. they've got a chance. They've got two more games with, with the University of Texas as well. And so, and I know others are doing the same thing. You know, South Alabama and Southern Miss historically always play, and and well, all of them, and Coastal, all of them play great Tuesday games. And um, so they've got a chance, if they win some of those, to pick up some more points heading into the latter part of the season and then into the tournament. Yeah, on Tuesday night, I've got Georgia State at Georgia. I think Georgia's at four right now in the RPI, and, and Georgia State won at Georgia last year. So, I mean... It may happen again. It'll be a good battle. It'll be interesting to see, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on, you know, because from Stromdahl's standpoint, Coach Brad Stromdahl, how do you manage that thing from a pitching standpoint? Because you got a big weekend series coming up. So we'll talk about that. There's three other teams. That's always an interesting part of it is how a coach manages it, knowing he's got a two or weekend series coming up. And there's three more Sun Belt teams in the top 100. Uh, Old Dominion 61, App State 67, and Texas State is at uh, 96. So that's where that stands right now, a total of 10 teams in the uh, top 100. Time now to talk to Louisiana Raging Cajuns head coach, Matt Diggs. Coach, thanks a lot for being with us today. Oh, thank you, Matt. I appreciate it. And you guys are off to a great start this season. You currently have the nation's longest winning streak 
at 11 games. You're 20 and 8 overall. This is the best Sun Belt start for your team in close to a decade. Going back to 2016, you're 8 and 1. What do you like about what you've seen from your team so far in the first 28 games? And is there anything that still concerns you as you look ahead to the second half of the season? Well, I think the whole thing, Matt, has been centered around good starting pitching and, uh, you know, a, a pretty strong bullpen at times and, and just a group of hitters that they adjusted a, a few weeks into the season. We had to tighten our approach and uh, just one through nine, they're tough and, and they function extremely well together. Uh, they play pretty good defense. We're not all the time pretty, but we just play a, a gritty brand of baseball that we're just hard to put away. And uh, I would I would say a lot of the a lot of the wins are just us outlasting people and and just being there at the end to finish, uh, both mentally and physically, just being engaged and and finding a way to to make it happen. And which is fun, uh, and it's a credit to these kids. I don't know that it's a strategy I would like to employ all the time. I mean, I'd like to see us, see us play good, clean baseball, but that's just. That's not who we are all the time. They just, uh, we find a way to get it done when it matters. Everything that you just said right there kind of describes, I think, uh, your third and final win at Texas State when you swept the series. First time you'd ever swept the series in San Marcos. And, you know, that's a hard place to sweep. That's a hard it's place tough. to win a series, much less, much less sweep a series, which you guys were able to do. Uh, you didn't really have the starting pitching that day, but you had the bullpen and you got some timely hits and a lot of hits from the bottom of your order in that series. You're right. And that's, that's kind of been our MO is you don't know who it's going to be, Matt. Uh, and you don't know where in the order it's going to come from, but it always starts with somebody on the bump that gives us a chance to come back. And that's what our guys did on, on Saturday. in that final game was they were able to throw up a couple of zeros or keep you know, the damage down to one run, uh, whatever it might be. And, that you know, one thing that we have done is come back all year. And, uh, you know, at some point th these kids are going to reach base and we're going to have our opportunity. And uh, we were able to get that done in the eighth and just had some gritty clutch at bats. And the boys were able to find a way to take the lead. And then we had LP sitting over there that we could go to at the end. Yeah, tell us about LP. Uh, Lange, and let, let me see if I get his name right. Langevin, 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 right? LP, LP is easier. You than just say it like I do, Langevin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's the LP. LP is easier than uh, Louis Philippe. Uh, I mean, if he, if no if doubt, that's not, a, that's not a Cajun name. I've never heard one, but that's a great name, and he's been. A we great just call guy. him Big Maple. Yeah, Big Maple, huh? Yeah, he's that's he's it. Been your, he's been on your guy. He's been your guy on the back end. He picked up two saves for you over the weekend against Texas State. He's tough now. It's a it's a disappearing fastball. It's got incredible ride on it, uh, you know, and it's from a real easy delivery. And he just gets so much extension, and that thing's spinning now, and it, it, it can ride on you. He can sink it. He can elevate it. Uh, and he's got pretty good command of it. Uh, he's got a big future, Matt. And, uh, you know, I was proud of the job he did not only on, on Thursday. That was dominant. But to come back on a day's rest uh, – 45 pitches, he gets a day off, and then come back and be able to finish that thing. And it was he was under duress from the from the jump, and they definitely adjusted. Uh, they started trying to get the bat head out there, and and uh, the lead off the first baseman almost almost jumped ship on him, which wound up being big that that ball stayed in the ballpark. So we get one out, and then they were able to scratch a couple, and it won. You know, they ultimately have the winning run on base, and yeah, uh, he when he run it first, high and run it second, and you had more coming yeah. to the plate. And you got the last two guys to pop up to end the out of 79 total pitches on the weekend, and most of them in high leverage situations for this young man. No doubt. And that, you know, we can start him and, and we get to see him once a week, or we can strategically use him in spots out of the bullpen where he still gets, you know, 100 pitches in, but it's just at different spots that might be more of more importance than, say, him going and starting a game for us. Kind of take us through your pitching philosophy, and Gunnar Leger is back, one of the all-time greats for the Cajuns. He's back as your pitching coach, a young pitching coach. Uh, talk about your approach with him as a young pitching coach and also your pitching staff because most of your guys, you, I mean, you got your stars. Flonoy has been a starter for you, uh, and, and I think uh, Morgan – or uh, Herman and Morgan, they've all had bullpen appearances, I guess is the point I'm trying to make. So you you use your guys sure. in multiple 
multiple ways, not just starting pitching outside of Flunoy, who's had six starts. Well, we've had to get creative, Matt. And, and, uh, I always say that your opening weekend rotation is probably not going to finish that way. I've never seen it happen. And, uh, but those guys are at the top for a reason. And, uh, you know, for one reason or another, we've got to shuffle the deck, but the same kids keep coming back to the top and you pick up a couple of new ones along the way that, that are able to, to get it done. You know, these boys really respond to Gunner. He's only 28. He's going to be, he's a future Hall of Famer here. Uh, he's one of the best pitchers in the history of this program. And uh, he works. He loves to compete. Uh, he understands the game at a high level, especially for his age. And uh, he he knows how to relate to these kids. And, and you really got to have that nowadays. And so uh, I let him do his thing. I, I plug in, a, you know, advice or, or things that I see or would want to do along the way. But, uh, you know, that's his pitching staff. He runs it as he sees fit. And we, uh, you know, he'll he'll seek me for, you know, what I want to do. Uh, as far as a starter, bullpen, et cetera. But he's done a really good job. I think we lead the league in ERA and strikeouts. And, and now, look, we have some talented arms, and uh, but he's done a really good job of developing those arms. Where we had to get better was just figuring out who fit where, what role, and then what's the stint look like? How long does this guy need to go? And uh, we've had a lot of success doing that here lately. Gunner learned from one of the best, Tony Robichaux. Of course, he was your mentor. Sure did. We all know. We all know your story with with Tony and how special he was to you, and how you came back and and took over for him after his untimely passing. Uh, if if there's a if there's a Matt Degg stamp to the program, what have you taken that you put your stamp on and you know continued the success and maybe did it a little bit different way, your way as compared to Robes? I think you know I just came in and we picked right up where we left off in 14 and uh you know their coach robe and his family and and cajun nation and especially that 2014 team is the sole reason i came back here and uh for everything they meant to me and my family we should have won a national championship that year i'm still extremely close to that team and uh you know my my stamp is this is that we're going to play fast hard and loose we're uncommon and i want to compete like a bunch of savages and uh <laughs> that's what cajun nation responds to and that's what they expect out of us i love that and, and you're right i mean that's a great way to describe your program and you've had back-to-back ncaa's now i'd say you're tracking for a third straight and of course i don't want to jinx it yeah, i don't believe in that anyway but still i mean you know uh you're tracking towards a third straight here uh, getting back. What's that meant to your program to be back in the NCAA consecutive seasons now the last couple of years after a five-year absence from the NCAA? Yeah, I, I take a ton of pride in that because uh, of what coach in this program meant to me and means to me. And uh, I think if coach was here, he'd tell you that it was they were hurting and uh, it wasn't, you know, they weren't going through the best of times uh, when the good Lord called him home. And, and so the bulk of my job, Matt, has been turning this around and getting the clubhouse and the coaching staff and and the personnel and everything where it needed to be and where it should be uh, at a, a program this proud and historic. And, you know, to see us win the league and then make a run into A&M Regional and then, you know, get in at large, which is really cool, uh, and then do what we're doing right now. There's no sweeter feeling in the world. For me, you know, this is it for me. I don't, I don't have, uh, I'm not chasing anything. This is, this is home. This is it. And uh, I'll either coach for the Cajuns or I'll, you know, good Lord will have me doing something else. Uh, yeah. So this place means everything to me. And, and uh, to have it on the trajectory where we're at is taking a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, not just from myself, but from a lot of people. Omaha's the next goal, right? I mean, that's the, way it's the only goal. Yeah. It's the only goal. And uh, I believe that this is a place that is capable of getting Omaha as we've done before. And uh, we've been number one in the nation before. And uh, it's a place that can get to Omaha and not only get to Omaha, it can play for a national championship. And uh, that's the only goal. Tell me about Kyle DeBarge. What have you seen from him this year? Preseason, you know, all Sun Belt, uh, actually preseason player of the year uh, in, in the Sun Belt Conference. I don't know when he uh, when he was honored with that. I checked out his Twitter page. I think he's got pinned on his Twitter page about you know how he's going to get to the big league. So I mean that's his goal. Yep. That's the goal of a lot of guys. That's him. Uh, 
Yeah. Tell us about Kyle. But that's him. And uh, that's one of the reasons that I really wanted him here is I saw that on his Twitter page and I believe him. Uh, you know, it took about a year being around him and I told him, you're, you're my favorite player I've ever had. And he just is. He's got it. And whatever it is, however you want to define it, he's got it in spades. And uh, yet he's very humble. He's the hard, you know, he's one of the hardest workers. Uh, he's never hurt. Uh, he's always early. He's always staying late. Like anything that you're looking for uh, to build a championship culture around, he embodies all of it with incredible talent. And, uh, you know, if you could pick any kid in the country to start a team, he'd be my first draft pick every time. There's so many other guys on your team. I just love to watch play. John Taylor's got a career high 16 game hit streak right now. I think he's been on base in every game this year. Uh, Lee Amade, who's playing third base, had two crucial game changing hits for you over the weekend. And your catcher, Jose Torres, I love his story. This young man went six years, I think, without seeing his family. Yeah. Moved to the States from Panama to play high school baseball and now college baseball, you know, with the goal of getting, you know, to the majors one day too, I'm sure. But I love his story. And, you know, he continues that great legacy you guys always seem to have at catcher. It's crazy what a person will do to chase a dream. And that's that's Jose. And boy, he's infectious. You know, it took him about a split second to become a fan favorite no doubt. and uh, just his intensity and energy and style of play uh, and just his competitiveness. Uh, John Taylor is just a throwback. He, he, he's a Pete Rose type. That, just always uh, gets a big just, hit, I think. Doesn't he? <laughs> he, uh, he plays his butt off, man. And uh, you can't hold him down very long. You might get him once or twice, but it's not going to change his at-bats. Uh, plays really good defense. And uh, he's one of our team leaders, uh, along with Debo and, and, and Dylan Toit. Uh, Lee Amadi has come a long way. He's always had the hit tool. Uh, he's had to work extremely hard with Coach Thibodeau on his defense. Uh, to find his way in the lineup, and he's done that. I, th that's what I like about this team and offense is it's not – yeah, you can point out the barge. It's, it's easy, you know. My, my wife could do that easy. But it's – it it would take a real trained eye to go, look, this guy's key, this guy's key, and, and because it's just a bunch of them working together. A couple of th things before we go here. I guess just a little, a little bit of get to know Matt Dix. Who was your favorite player growing up, and who was your team growing up? Astros unequivocally, uh, and Jeff Bagwell, and uh, that old nasty helmet. Oh boy! I mean, kind of like the barge. If if you said, "Hey, here's a you can start your own major league team. Who's your first pick?" It'd be Jeff Bagwell. I just thought. The way he played, the way he led, and uh, just who he is, and and he could do what people don't realize is he could do a lot of everything, and uh, he was a great base runner. He had two or three hundred stolen bases, uh, most by a first baseman. Uh, you know, average a hundred runs scored a year, a hundred walks a year, a hundred RBIs a year. He's just very complete ball player. And uh, growing up down there in that area. Uh, you know, I'm I'm all used to anything and, and uh, always have been. No doubt about it. All right. Uh, just a couple of, just off the top of your head, what's your favorite food? Mexican. Mexican. Go, you eat anything Mexican in food. particular? Yeah. Is it burritos? Is it tacos? Is it I like burritos? fajitas. I like fajitas. Yeah, yeah I eat any of it. Uh, I'm but yeah, you. like I said, growing up where we grew up, I mean, it's, uh, I love Mexican food. I love a good steak. Uh, Who does? I like to eat. I eat whatever. <laughs> yeah, it, it, there's not much that I push away from my push yeah. away from yeah the plate away from me. Okay, favorite movie of all time? Oh man, just whatever. Goodfellas has to be up there. Oh, it's great. Uh, great movie. Goodfellas, Tombstone, uh, Miracle, uh, Lone Survivor. Uh, uh, You're just a dude. You're just a guy. Mel, I mean, <laughs> Mel Gibson. Uh, you know, he hollers freedom. What is that? Uh, oh, Braveheart. William Wallace. Uh, Braveheart. 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 Yeah. Where he's all painted up in blue. It's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good story. Yeah. Good story. Well, Coach, thanks a lot for yeah. visiting with us today and look forward to catching up with you later yep. in the season. And good luck the rest of the way, too. 
Thanks a lot, Matt. We'll see you. It's always great to talk to Matt Deggs and look forward to catching up with the Raging Cajuns as we go through the season. All right. Uh, welcome back. You're watching the Sun Belt Baseball Podcast with Matt and Ty. We're going to be doing this every week leading up to the tournament. Just kind of keep you up to date on the Sun Belt Conference. So we invite you to subscribe. Hit the subscribe button so you'll get notifications when the next podcast is ready to drop. And also, hey, if you have a business you'd like to sponsor and, and be a part of this and come up with some kind of feature on the show, we'd be happy to talk to you about it. So you can just hit us up on email or just hit us up there in the comment section and we'll get in touch with you. All right. So this is one thing we're going to do every week. We did this in basketball. We did the starting five. So we're going to do our starting nine. So rather than just name a Sun Belt player and pitcher of the week, we're going to try to give a little bit more recognition. So we're going to put together a whole starting nine. And the whole starting nine is going to be based on what those guys did this week. So coach, we'll get it going. And you just make a comment, whether you agree or disagree, you got somebody else you'd like to throw in there, but I'm going to start at catcher and I'm going to start with the raging Cajuns catcher, Jose Torres, who uh, went five for 11 with a double and three RBI really impressed with this young man and the story behind his game as well. More than the thumbs up on this young man. I, and obviously I'm fresh coming out of this weekend. I mean, I bought weekends in, I was calling him Charlie hustle. I mean, every, he, he was just everywhere. And when he needed to go to the mound to make an emotional visit to get the pitcher's attention, or if he had to come up with a big hit, or if he had to move a runner, or for or just whatever it was, the pace of the game was determined by this young man, and he was really fun to watch behind the play. Ironically, he's the second catcher that I know of who has that story, a young man who came to the States from Panama at the age of 16, went to school here, you know, left his family behind and came here to play high school ball and then college ball. George has got a same kid just like it, Fernando Gonzalez, same story. And he went and he played his high school ball in Atlanta, then signed with George. And I know uh, Torres uh, played in Florida and then signed with Louisiana. So it's interesting. Uh, I, I know two instances of that, and both of them are great players and probably certainly going to be pros and maybe have a shot at the majors because catching is such a tough position. And uh, if he's a great receiver uh, like uh, Gonzalez is, he, you know, more power to him right there. So, I'll tell you that. Now, the offense is just a bonus. My first baseman is going to be uh, Duncan Pastor, another Raging Cage, and he went two for six, had a double four RBI. He was big for the Cajuns at the bottom of the order. I know he was a guy that uh, had some pretty big numbers at uh, Division Two Nova Southeastern before he got to Louisiana. Was even a pitcher. I think he, I think I read he was in the 90s as a pitcher at Nova. Yeah, I think uh, he, he played first. He also DH'd uh, on the weekend. And, you know, a lot of times when guys make that move up to Division One baseball, um, it's about their ability to, to get after 93 to 94 mile an hour fastballs. Can they catch up? Can they? There's a lot of different things to that. And in that same breath, a lot of guys, when they're recruited out of high school, they, they maybe just haven't grown into their bodies yet. There's so many different factors that come into it. Now with the portal, you're going to see more and more of that happening because these guys are getting that batch. And then all of a sudden you see a senior who's 22 years old, he's got one year of eligibility left go up to a division one school and be able to handle it offensively and be able to handle the below. But he certainly was good this weekend and his numbers and coach Degg spoke about him tremendously heading into the weekend. How about uh, second baseman, Joseph Zamora of app state. He went five for 12 Homer, three doubles. He has a seven game double streak, not a seven game hitting streak, but a seven game streak where he's got doubles in every game. <laughs> well, well, I'm not, I have no idea what that would ever feel like to have seven double, seven game double <laughs> streak going on. I'm not, whatever I can't even say it, so it never would have registered for me as a player. But um, yeah, no, I had a chance to see two weekends ago and uh, a really nice, a really good player and a very offensive player. And obviously, when if you go back and you look at App State and, and the stats, when they win, you're going to see his on that hit column with, with plus hits and plus RBIs, obviously, and, and then obviously with the seven game doubles hitting streak going on. And then, you know, I would throw the other guy in there just because it's fresh off of there. Um, I thought the Taylor kid played really good for Lafayette. I'm sorry, Louisiana. Again, right. I mean, he's, you know, you and I got to see him a year or so ago in a tournament, and he's, he's got bigger and physical. And, boy, you talking about just some kind of fun to watch play defense. No doubt. He just gets big hits all the time. He's got a 16-game hitting streak 
and he's been on base in all 28 games this season. He's a real ball player, no doubt about it. Uh, shortstop, I got Wyatt Piper. Piper of uh, James Madison. He went four for 10, had a homer, a double, three RBI. He's got a team leading 337 batting average for the Dukes, and he also leads them with eight doubles. Yeah, I'm going to give you more, nothing but thumbs up on that. Again, I, coming out of my weekend on TV, I had a chance to watch – uh, Labarge play, who's a really good player for uh, Louisiana, and then also Davis Powell from Texas State, who had, had, you know, maybe two weeks ago wasn't hitting to what he did last year, which I thought he was one of the better shortstops in the league last year, because I get to see him often enough. And he started to play better, and he actually had a pretty decent weekend this past weekend against the Cajuns. But yes, absolutely. And I think what everybody's got to realize and why we're doing this is that this is this week. We don't know what's coming next week with, the, with these positions. Yeah, that's what that's the that's the beauty of this starting nine. We're not naming we're not naming an all conference team. We're just telling you who. It is. <laughs> right. Will Mize, Georgia State, going to go with him at third base, six for thirteen, couple of doubles, three RBI. He leads them in home runs. He's got eight, twenty five now in his career. He pretty much leads the Panthers in all the major uh, offensive categories. Just hit. He's been he's been doing that for what is that two years three years now he's been he's been a great hitter for them and a good player for them defends you know obviously good enough and but you know eight homers at this point is going to put you somewhere in the top of your team uh, for the most part and now you'll start to actually see from this month moving forward guys getting into that twelve to fourteen you know ratio of, of homers but that yeah, young man can hit and I'm, I'm yeah and he's been fun to watch over the last year or two. Outfielders are going to be Banks Tolly of App. He has a team leading 11 home runs, hit three over the weekend as they beat Marshall two out of three. Carson Pato of uh, Southern Miss, uh, he leads them with six home runs. He had a two-homer weekend as uh, Southern Miss beat Troy. And then Luke Waters of Old Dominion as well. He went six for 10. He had a couple of homers, and he's one of those guys. He pretty much leads the Monarchs in all their offensive categories. Is the majority of the guys that you've named out already are guys that were in the league a year ago and have some experience in this league. The reason why I say that is it, it shows you what having experience can mean. And if you've been through this league before and you've seen the types of arms that this league has and, and you know, every Friday, Saturday and Sunday, you're seeing really good arms. And you're seeing 92 to 94, or you're seeing power breakers, or you're seeing above average secondary stuff out of starters and relievers. And so it's just kind of interesting when you start naming off these names, how I could say, oh, wait, I remember that guy. Oh, wait, I remember that guy. Oh, wait, I remember that guy. And so uh, a lot of experience in your starting lineup as of this week. And our DH, now this is this kind of goes back to what we were just talking about a few moments ago. We're not naming an all-conference team. We're just out talking about guys who had a big weekend. And this guy right here, Cameron Miller of App, he's going to get the DH spot. He went four for nine, couple of homers, one double, seven RBI. That was the first home run in RBI of the freshman's career. He'd only had three starts coming into the weekend, had a big weekend at the plate as the DH for the Mountaineers, so he makes our Sun Belt starting nine for the week. Didn't see that much when he was in, in San Marcos. And so yeah. uh, to hear a fresh face, and a fresh name to come in there is, is always exciting. Obviously, you got to put him in there with the type of offense he had and the kind of weekend he had. And I don't, I don't know if he had been injured or if he was just finding his way into the lineup. Yeah. Or coaches are always continually trying to find that, that combination that works. And so looks like they found a new combination that is going to work for him. Well, as you know, in college baseball, Coach, there is no six-week spring training to figure out yeah. – who fits where? You have to do that on the fly when the season gets started. Absolutely. So our starting rotation, I'm going Thomas Higgins, Georgia Southern, picked up his third win of the season. He combined with Mitchell Gross on a two-hit yep. seven-inning shutout, dropped his uh, team-leading ERA to 2.54. Cameron Flukey of Coastal Carolina, I know they're happy this freshman stepped up because they've been a little shaky on the on the, on the the bump. But eight strikeouts, picked, the freshman picked up his first career win. He leads them with 40 strikeouts. That's 15-plus K per nine inning if you average it yeah. out. And then Jackson Steamsma, app, he carried a no-hitter into the fifth inning against Marshall, ended up with a win and uh, had seven strikeouts, his third win of the season. Well, all unbelievable choices anytime you're throwing a shutout. 
you got to consider anybody that's able to be contribute or be a part of the shutout. You win when you throw shutouts. 99. No, that's, <laughs> that's what I was looking at. I was looking. <laughs> yeah. I, I look at my list, and when I see zeros, those gonna you know zeros are the best. And those guys have Hard a lot of zeros in the, in the run and in the yeah. hit department. So they weren't giving up much runs. They weren't giving up much hits. And our closer is going to be the guy that we just finished talking about with Matt Deggs, uh, LP Longevin. Man, what a performance by this guy over the weekend. And Coach Deggs, of course, just had glowing things to say about this guy. But he ended up throwing 79 pitches. Almost every one of them were high leverage pitches in that Texas State series. And, uh, you know, he picked up two saves over the weekend. The best word for me to say is, wow, I saw it. And I've seen a lot of games. I've seen a lot of Big 12 games. I've seen a lot of SEC games and Sunbelt, obviously. He came in and uh, he threw, I don't remember, it was 50 some odd pitches on the first game on Thursday night. He threw one breaking ball and one changeup. Struck out six, three and a third. It's 92 to 94. We see that all the time. But 92, 94, and that ball comes out spinning like nobody's business. And his spin rate is through the roof, his command. And, and Coach Degg said it before the game. He, is, he loves to attack the zone. Well, he attacked the zone all right. He attacked everything around it, the hitters, the zone, everybody. Now, his, his intestinal fortitude and his courage and his will to win came out on Saturday. His stuff was not the same. Didn't expect it to be. It was on such short rest. To come back in and as you mentioned it, a high leverage moment, which the whole each time he was out there and every time he had the ball in his hand, there was something on it. Um, and he walked one or two, gave up a couple of hits. They got the tying run to second, the winning run to first base with one out, and he got two pop ups to follow it up and finish the game. It, it's hard to run away from what that represents when you do what you did on game one. And then basically 36 hours later, you're coming back out there again and doing it. And in the high leverage moments you referred to, it was really impressive. Yeah, it was. I mean, you, you, the points you made right there, I think, are really big in that we saw two different sides of this guy. We saw him on Thursday, and he's dominant. Six of the ten outs he got were strikeouts. And then he came back on Saturday. Not, you know, his stuff is not as good but he still was able to get out of those situations where the tying runs at second and the winning runs at first, and he had to get two outs, and he did it. And Mora was one of the guys that he got. Yeah. Um, and, and, again, I think had it been the first weekend, the first month of the season, he, he's not going to do that. I think they have built him up to this moment. And then I think when you see a chance to sweep on the road, um, you, you ask him if he's ready to do it. You've built him up for that moment. And so now whether he goes out there tomorrow night on the back end of the game, I have no idea, uh, but he would be back ready fresh again on the weekend. But when you get a chance to sweep an opponent, particularly one of Texas State's quality, and you got to run your best guy out there, and that's certainly what they did. And, I mean, he showed his guts, no doubt about it. And so the Cajuns have ULM this weekend. As we look ahead to the weekend, I'm looking at that uh, Georgia State at Georgia Southern series. Uh, so much riding there. RPI wise, they're about the same. So you got the RPI battle in the standings. Georgia State seven and two. Georgia Southern's five and four. So there's a lot riding on the game from a standing standpoint. And of course, there's a lot riding on the game from a bragging rights standpoint. They both have, as we've already talked about with Georgia State, they've got Georgia on Tuesday. Then they go to Statesboro. But how about Georgia Southern? They go to Coastal Carolina on Tuesday, at South Carolina on Wednesday. And then come home. So they got a five-game week. Both these coaches, Rodney Hennon and Brad Stromdahl, have their work cut out for them getting ready for their weekend series. I've never been afraid to get on the road and go play anybody. I, I, I think if, if the Yankees called, he'd say, yeah, count us in. Let's go to it. And, and Coach Stromdahl the same way. But I've known Rodney for so long and, and competed against him so long. And that's not surprising, by the way. And that's what his fans and his fan base expect, by the way. I mean, that's what he's built up over time. And, and also, in, in, in their situation, I think it's why they've always played so good in the tournament. They played, their non-conference has always been so good, and they're over there in that area by you where you've got a lot of great you know, ACC and SEC-type schools you can get to in different places, and I, I think it pays off for them at the end. It's going to be a great week for them. Absolutely. Well, Coach, good stuff. 
Uh, hope everybody enjoyed our first podcast. And again, hit the subscribe button so you get notifications when our next one drops.